Good afternoon, morning, or evening, as the case may be. My name is uh, Clifford Kabansag. I am an addiction medicine physician practicing in Middletown, Ohio. In recognition of May 31 as World No Tobacco Day, as designated by uh, the WHO, I am presenting about the truth what Big Tobacco doesn't want you to know, and what you can do about it. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, unless otherwise cited, the views expressed in this presentation are solely mine. They in no way reflect the views of my employer, past or present, or of any society or organization of which I am or have been a member, please consult your physician before pursuing any course of treatment described here or elsewhere. Uh, special thanks to Kristen Waite Labot for the invitation to give this uh, presentation, as well as thanks to uh, John Silvani, who also was instrumental in me presenting this. So there is no lack of information regarding the negative health effects of uh, smoking. Everyone knows it's hazardous to your health, increases morbidity and mortality, in fact, it is the number one preventable cause of death, causing needless expense and astronomical health care costs. Yet, full knowledge of this is insufficient to deter use. Why? How many cigarettes are in a pack? Twenty. Why are there twenty cigarettes in a pack? I'm going to read some statements made by Big Tobacco. The cigarette is one of the most efficient drug delivery systems ever devised. Within seconds of the first inhalation, a dose of nicotine hits the brain, providing instantaneous satisfaction of nicotine craving and concomitant mood alteration. This is a quote from the litigation documents, uh, 1996. Without nicotine, there would be no smoking. Think of the cigarette as a dispenser or a dose unit of nicotine. And this is a big tobacco internal memo. As you can see here, when comparing the different modes of tobacco use, notice the very steep curve at, uh, in the upper right corner, or sorry, in the upper left corner regarding uh, the steepness of the curve there as far as the uh, onset of effect of all of the modes, all of the forms of tobacco, cigarettes, smoking are clearly the most uh, rapid acting as far as uh, brain activity goes. So this is showing a pattern of cigarette use. Notice in the upper white region that's actually nicotine toxicity and below the white region is showing a withdrawal or abstinence symptoms. The gray area in between the two basically demonstrates the asymptomatic pleasurable zone 
what I want to point out here is that each spike represents a cigarette. So there are 20 cigarettes in a pack. And out of what I call love and concern for the consumer, I'll say that big tobacco permits the luxury of four hours of sleep a night. If someone smokes greater than one pack per day, chances are he or she is being awakened by nicotine withdrawal and must smoke in order to fall back asleep. There is a 24 cigarette pack available in some locations. In any case, this should really offend our sensibilities. Think of it. Are there any substances, medications, or drugs that require hourly dosing? Talk about a harsh taskmaster. Uh, nicotine is the standard by which addiction is measured. Interesting. R Reynolds American. Interesting that they're the second biggest tobacco company, and yet they ban tobacco use on the entirety of their campus. For perspective as far as mortality goes. The number of uh, U.S. military casualties in the Second World War, about 292,000 uh, from battle causes, Second World War, other causes, about 114,000. So that places the total U.S. World War II deaths at about 406,000. In Vietnam, there were about 58,000. How many people in the U.S. die every year due to smoking and related causes? 50,000? Actually, 50,000 deaths from secondhand smoke alone. The total U.S. death rate from smoking is about 488,000. And when you look at it in terms of uh, U.S. military mortalities, this number is greater than all of those lost in the Second World War and Vietnam combined. But more relevant perhaps to us is that this is basically a COVID scale mortality rate each and every year. So let's break it down. 488,000 people die a year. You divide that by 365 days in a year, which gives us 1,336 people per day. Divide that by 24 hours in a day, which comes out to 55 people per hour, divided that by 60 minutes in an hour. Basically, that's one person a minute. Is everyone okay with this? Consider, tobacco is the only commercially available product when used, as intended, as received by the consumer, unaltered or otherwise uh, adjusted by the consumer, it kills half of the customers that use it. Now think about that. Can you think of a, another product that even comes close to the scale of death. Why do we
tolerate this with uh, smoking. Uh, I'm going to use these uh, terms, the plasticity and the malleability of the perception of risk. It, it looks at basically what we're considering is, yes, there is a cause of death, but the question is, how long does it take to die? So there's no question as to the lethality of this product. But what seems to be at issue is the time period in which death takes place. How short a time period to death until something is deemed unacceptably hazardous. Uh, within five minutes, five seconds of use, or five hours, or five days, perhaps five weeks, five months, or five years, there seems to be a point somewhere less than 50 or so years for which uh, the cause of death is not readily recognized. There's no doubt that it's lethal. I guess the question is how much time is acceptable for a person to die of said cause? This is a true story that I recently had with a patient. So she declined the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. And I asked her why, and she stated she was concerned about the risk of death. And I pointed out to her that the risk of such death is one in a million. That was too high a risk for her. And yet, when I asked her about her smoking and that there's basically a 50% a mortality, she really didn't have anything to say as far as justifying that other than I'd like to continue to smoke and I'll quit when I feel like it. So is this foolish? Or perhaps, is it dumb? Well, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, intelligence. Again, there is no lack of information about the negative health consequences of smoking. So why do we continue to smoke? Continued use despite full foreknowledge of harm. And what is this called? By definition, this is a substance use disorder or what was commonly referred to as an addiction. And in this case, we're talking about tobacco use disorder. So what can we do about it? Here are some points that I found to be helpful in assisting patients to stop smoking. So number one, make a firm commitment to quit. The only way that someone is going to continue to smoke is if they stop trying to quit. Then I recommend listing the top 10 reasons to quit on a piece of paper, and then post it prominently in a high traffic area in your home. That can be a bathroom mirror, or it could be the refrigerator. Basically what we're looking for is, particularly early in the cessation process, is motivation. And of course, as people come up with more reasons to quit, those should be added to the list as well. Certainly a discussion with the physician regarding the three FDA approved medications should take place. 
Uh, these include nicotine replacement, bupropion, and varenicline. That's Wellbutrin and Chantix, respectively. Using a medication for smoking cessation increases the likelihood of stopping at least 50%. Some studies demonstrate over 70% versus trying to stop without a medication. And as I tell my patients, if I can do something that increases my risk of success by 50, 60, 70%, why wouldn't I use that? And the next step is to set a quit date, write it down, and like your motivation 10 top reasons to quit list, it should be posted. The reason that this is important is that now it's no longer theoretical. It's no longer just a thought. It has been expressed and written down on paper, and that really helps uh, solidify one's commitment to quitting smoking versus simply contemplating it in one's mind. It's important to inform those around you. And what this does in effect is increase accountability. The thought now is, oh, I've actually told people that I'm stopping smoking. I better stop smoking. This is certainly a therape therapeutic use of positive peer pressure. Next, dispose of all of the tobacco, the lighters, any associated paraphernalia, all of the things that are required to smoke. If you cannot light a cigarette, or you don't have cigarettes, you cannot smoke. Now change your routines. If there's no place to smoke or, and or no time to smoke, no smoking takes place. What I mean by this is obviously of one's waking hours the overwhelming majority of time is spent not smoking. So clearly, there are periods when patients are not smoking. The other issue is there are certain places that people typically would not consider smoking in. For example, in a commercial airplane. For other people, it might be a car, or a room, whatever the case may be. And I suggest simply, over time, slowly enlarging that no smoking zone to include your dwelling, the area around it, your vehicles, or, at, or in the workplace. Uh, there is support available, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. It is both a state and national smoking cessation resource. If needed, the number could be dialed and you could be connected with a counselor who could assist you with not smoking at that moment. Uh, furthermore, some patients will qualify for a nicotine replacement free of charge. Ironically, there are still a number of insurances that do not cover nicotine replacement. So they're going to be lapses. I tell my patients, you know, don't be discouraged. On average, it takes between eight and 12 attempts 
before a year of cessation is achieved. So I, I typically say 10. And this process should be repeated as long as it takes to stop smoking. Again, continuing to smoke should simply not be an option. And put another way, the only way someone is going to continue smoking is if he or she stops trying to quit. So just a word about the FDA approved medications. Nicotine replacement therapy, these include probably the most commonly known is the patch. There are also other products including uh, lozenges, gum, uh, in rare cases, there's actually a nicotine uh, inhaler. I speak with a lot of patients about previous cessation attempts. Most of them admit to using some sort of nicotine replacement, usually the patches. They often state that it didn't work for me. The number one and two causes of failure of nicotine replacement therapy is number one, insufficient dose. So the step one, 21 milligram patch is recommended by the manufacturer to be sufficient for one pack per day. Well, in fact, it's not. So it's not realistic to expect the overwhelming majority of smokers who smoke a pack per day to be able to stop with the step one 21 milligram patch. The other issue is the way the patches are set up. It's supposed to be step one 21 milligrams for four weeks, then step two 14 milligrams for four weeks. Finally, step one, seven milligrams daily for four weeks. Well, the problem is that is not near enough. I like to point out that just in terms of numerical, the sheer numerical time someone smoked, I mean, is it realistic to expect to achieve cessation after three months of treatment? You know, obviously not. What I recommend is if someone is smoking one pack per day, I typically prescribe both the 21 milligram patch and a seven milligram patch. For the uh, best results, some sort of as needed nicotine replacement should also be written. There, there is gum, lozenges and mini lozenges. I prefer to prescribe the mini lozenges in that they seem to be very well tolerated. They're about the size of a Tic Tac. These should be used as needed up to every hour. In fact, there are uh, four milligram form formulations so prescribing the two milligram lozenge, one could theoretically use two of those every hour to stave off nicotine withdrawal symptoms and cravings. I'm often asked, or one of the fears that patients often express is nicotine toxicity. Uh, two things on that. Uh, number one, unless someone has severe cardiovascular disease, nicotine replacement in such a patient is not contraindicated. I mean, think about it. If they're going to smoke, they're going to receive nicotine anyway, but along with it, known carcinogens, carbon monoxide, etc. There is 
a uh, range between nicotine withdrawal and toxicity. You'll recall from the, the graph. So I tell patients the first symptom of nicotine toxicity is nausea. Put another way, if you are still having nicotine withdrawal symptoms and cravings, and you're not nauseated, you can feel free to continue to use the as needed uh, nicotine replacement. Uh, some other fine points about that. The patch can be placed anywhere on the trunk, back and arms that is below the neck and above the waist. They should be placed um, after bathing, in which case the skin is prepped and ready to accept a patch. And of course, the previous day's patch should be uh, removed with a new patch is placed. Uh, the other thing I like to point out is uh, uh, the the lozenges, for example, they are actually absorbed sublingually, in which case um, first pass metabol uh, hepatic or other metabolism is bypassed. If someone swallows the saliva saturated with nicotine that can often cause nausea and can cause it relatively quickly. So again, nicotine replacement under the tongue for lozenges uh, for gum that can be placed in the oral buccal mucosa as well as under the tongue. Another advantage to nicotine replacement is that adjunctive treatment with bupropion is possible and in fact recommended in cases that have of patients who have severe tobacco use disorder. A word about bupropion, otherwise known as Wellbutrin. Uh, there is contraindication in someone with a seizure disorder as bupropion has been known to decrease the uh, seizure threshold. When prescribed, this medication should be taken only in the morning, that is during waking hours. It does have a slightly activating activity and keep in mind it's also, or originally FDA approved for depression. One of the nice things about this medication when compared to medications in general, and particularly antidepressants, is that this is one of the few that is at least weight neutral, and in fact, more often than that, than that a weight negative that is often associated with some mild weight loss. Off-label, this has been used to treat um, ADD, ADHD. Uh, this is an alternative for people with that diagnosis for whom we want to avoid the uh, high risk potential of stimulant use disorder when using a pure CNS stimulant. And again, as I mentioned, bupropion with nicotine replacement is certainly superior than either alone. Keep in mind, too, that despite how good, how effective a treatment course might be, a medic uh, medication course might be, 
what it comes down to is what is the patient willing to take? What is the patient uh, willing to do on a daily basis? So often I start out stepwise. I might start a low dose bupropion, 75 or 100 milligrams daily, and then increase the dose as it is tolerated over time the 150 and 300 for most patients, although a lot of the studies were actually performed on lower doses of bupropion. Reniclin, otherwise known as Chantix. Studies have shown that it is the most effective smoking cessation medication. Now, the problem is many insurances do not cover it, particularly as a first line treatment. Many insurance companies require a failure of either and nicotine replacement and bupropion. There is not a lot of evidence demonstrating uh, safety and efficacy of combining varenicline with either bupropion or nicotine replacement therapy, but there has been an increased interest in this. It'll be interesting to see what the uh, meta-analyses show. An advantage to Reniclin is it's designed in such a way that a patient can continue to smoke for the first week while taking Reniclin. One of the notorious side effects are disturbing dreams. For some patients, this is a deal breaker, and for others, not. Uh, some patients report saying or report that they knew that they were there was a possibility of them having disturbing dreams they knew it was coming it was not particularly distressful to them so they tolerated it and continued to take it but again as effective as varenicline is it's only as good as the patient is willing to take it There are a multitude of reasons for cessation. As mentioned, the negative health effects are well known. Certainly the decrease in morbidity and mortality is a motivation. I point this out particularly when someone is being treated for a different substance use disorder, mostly opioid use disorder. I ask, why is it that you're seeking treatment at this time? Answers often include the health, family, longevity. I point out, and I might even say, it would be an ironic shame for you to bring your opioid use disorder into full remission only for you to die of a tobacco related cause. That does not make any sense. It's something for the patient to ponder. The uh, financial benefit of stopping is obvious. Certainly there are applications available that calculate based on your per day tobacco use how much you are saving. Uh, these applications can be found readily and are available for uh, smartphones. Another point I like to make is, particularly when a patient has children, I stress to them how important it is for their children, 
who have been unwittingly conferred with an increased risk of developing a substance use disorder. They do not have the luxury in many cases of even experimentation. And often, I do as I say, not as I do, it doesn't work. And again, by example, more is caught than taught, per se. In other words, if smoking cessation is serious enough for the patient to do so, that is a compelling reason in and of itself for uh, their children to either stop or not start smoking altogether. Now, there is a perception among when, many that classify cannabis as the gateway drug. This really is not the case. The gateway drugs are in fact the legal ones, and that includes tobacco and alcohol. So if these can be avoided through childhood, adolescence and into young adulthood, the likelihood of developing another substance disorder is very low. Probably the most compelling reason is what smoking cessation does for overall abstinence from whatever substance use disorder. And I often ask patients outright, if there was something more that you could do to help you abstain from opioids, would you do it? Most say yes, most do not hesitate. But there are those who hesitate and there are those who say it depends on what it is, in which case they have demonstrated an unwillingness to do anything that could help them stop using. Studies have shown an increased likelihood of achieving abstinence from other substances by smoking or tobacco cessation. Uh, depending on which study, some show as low as 50% uh, increased risk or increased likelihood of abstinence upon smoking cessation, up to 450%. And to round it off, I often say increased likelihood of achieving abstinence by three hundred percent versus continuing to smoke or use tobacco. The other thing I like to point out is there are people who would like to discontinue opioid agonist treatment for opioid use disorder. Certainly patients are free to discontinue, most of them do so with the thought of not relapsing. I recommend to my patients that before any serious thought is given about discontinuing medication-assisted treatment, for the best results, smoking cessation should take place first. And again, that dramatically decreases the risk of relapse with the other substance use disorders. Here are some resources that I found to be helpful. There are, of course, many, many resources available. As I mentioned before, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Uh, nurses might want to seriously consider becoming a certified tobacco treatment specialist. And you can find more information about that 
at cttp.org. The curriculum is basically uh, 40 hours. It's often completed in a single week, but there are other uh, options available. This, I think, can really go far in helping patients stop smoking. It is a, a credential and it's typically renewed every two or so years given uh, sufficient CMEs. So I recommend, I urge you, for those of you who would like to go further in terms of assisting patients with smoking cessation, by all means, become a certified tobacco treatment specialist if at all possible. When it comes to substance use disorders, uh, people are most familiar with 12-step, uh, such as AA, NA. There is another approach based on rational emotive behavioral therapy, SMART recovery. SMART, which is an acronym for self-management and recovery training, uh, using principles from REBT and motivational interviewing, patients can learn skills to change actually any undesirable behavior. And certainly this applies to uh, tobacco use as well. Uh, the scientific basis for the effectiveness of REBT is well established. The other thing I like to point out is through smart recovery, there is a mandatory and standardized facilitators training. It takes place over the course of about three months. It's very doable. And in fact, when I compare the facilitators training, which I've completed, with what I learned in fellowship training uh, in addiction medicine, the uh, concepts and the material, I think are very much on par with what I saw in fellowship. The founder of REBT is the psychologist, Dr. Albert Ellis. He has an institute, there's the web address listed there. He was uh, instrumental in really standardizing this. While he's no longer alive, there are a number of his lectures that can be easily found on YouTube. This is a smoking cessation brochure I've examined a lot of material, and I've found this one to be the most comprehensive. A PDF of this can be found at www.becomeanx.org. It is actually produced in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic. There's something that I've labeled vicarious self-efficacy. In a previous life, I used to be a school orchestra director, a music teacher, and I was shown evidence that elucidated what the major determinants of student performance is. Surprisingly, it's not socioeconomic status, it's not race, it's not parental occupation. The most indicative factor in student performance was in fact teacher expectation. 
I think the same concepts can be applied to what we do. Certainly, we're about fostering success in patients changing, discontinuing undesirable behavior. I had a, a discussion with a fellow internal resident one day in the outpatient clinic. And he was, I'll say it, complaining about how non-compliant his patients were. And yet, they still came for appointments. And to quote him, he said, they're non-compliant. What do they want me to do, absolve them? To which I replied, look, if we don't think that they concede, succeed, what makes us think that they think they can succeed? In which case, are they likely to succeed? No. I formulated the following Latin phrase that I would like to be placed on my tombstone. Credere in aliis in erum pro, translated believe in others on their behalf. Again, this is what I call vicarious self-efficacy. Uh, in closing, uh, I'd like to share this painting with you. It's by the Belgian artist René Marguerite, entitled Le Clairvoyance, the Chloe the clairvoyant, which he painted in 1936. When I saw this painting for the first time, I was very much struck by the symbolism. So the artist is looking at an egg as the subject. And yet, he's painting a bird. That doesn't change the fact that he was actually looking at an egg. So he was looking at the egg, not so much as an egg, but what that egg had the potential to become. And again, isn't this vicarious self-efficacy? What do you see? Potential realized. Uh, if there are any questions, I've listed my email below, drkabansag at paxtreatmentcenters.com. If I can be of any further assistance, please feel to reach out. I thank you for viewing this a webinar in celebration of World No Tobacco Day. I hope that you were able to glean at least a few things that hopefully can be effective in helping your patients discontinue smoking, uh, tobacco use. Thank you.